I'm going to be presenting uh, my work uh, that I completed for my master's thesis this past spring, um, in which you know we basically set out the answer questions we've all assumed to be true: Are fires getting larger and more severe in the Southwest? Um, but before I get to that, I'm going to give you a brief background and tell you what severity is, why it's important to study, and uh, how we can study it with remote sensing technology. Uh, then I'll talk about a project where I pulled all of my data from, the MTS project, which some of you may be already familiar with. Um, but this webinar is going to be split into two parts. And in part one, I'm going to talk about how I was able to modify MTS's data set with a technique and create a more robust data set in which to analyze the trends in high severity fire. Uh, basically, I'm going to tell you how I was able to create a more complete burn severity outlook to the Southwest. And then in part two, I'm going to talk about um, the trend analysis and severity and then answer the questions we've all been wanting to know. So as you'll notice um, throughout this webinar, there's a navy blue uh, sidebar on the left of your screen. Uh, it's going to serve as a reference for you to follow where I'm at through the entire presentation. And uh, so you don't get lost and you know where we're headed. So with that, um, we'll dive right into the background information. And I'm relatively new to these webinars, so how yeah, this goes today. So we often hear of the narrative of fire exclusion and how it's impacted our western forest. Uh, you know, fire is a keystone ecological disturbance process that recycles nutrients, relates succession, reduces biomass, controls insect and disease populations. So without fire, we get the current conditions um, that we've all experienced and too well acquainted with which is uh, increased tree densities, increased fuel loading, um, canopy closures, increase in insect disease epidemics. But most importantly, uh, fire explosion has led to an increase in fire activity. So thanks to Westerling and others landmark paper published 10 years ago, we know that fires have increased in frequency. Uh, they've increased in total area burns with longer fire durations and longer fire seasons. But new questions are prevailing since then, which is how are these fires burning and what are their ecological consequences? And this is where severity comes into play. So what exactly is severity? Well, it's the, uh, simply it's the degree of ecological change. So the greater degree of change, the higher the severity. But why is it important? Uh, it impacts ecosystems at the point, plot, and landscape level, for example. Uh, high severity fires will consume large amounts of above and below ground biomass. <clears throat> it will affect vegetation structure and composition, cause negative uh, impacts to watersheds, destroy wildlife habitats, and of course it affects the carbon cycle by increasing carbon emissions, decreasing carbon sinks, all reasons to study severity. But how can we measure severity? Uh, one way severity can be measured is through remote sensing, uh, with multispectral remote sensing technology. And it does this based on a uh, reflectance of overstory trees and ground exposure. And it'll get an image like you see on the left of the screen, which is the qualifier, and that's the burn scar of that. So the Landsat program has been providing continuous and repetitive satellite imagery of the Earth's surface since 1972. And this is where most folks are getting their burn severity data from, the Landsat program. Okay, so in order to extract that burn signal from these images, we have to apply a burn severity metric. Okay, and, and although there are many metrics to infer burn severity, I use the RDMBR, or the Relative Difference Normalized Burn Ratio, devised by Miller and Thode in 2007. Uh, I use this metric specifically because it takes into account vegetation before the fire, and it makes it uh, effective when comparing multiple fires across space and time. So over on the right hand of the screen, you'll see uh, an RDMBR image of the Red Chest Sky Fire, and the higher values will indicate uh, higher severity. So I acquired all my burn security data from the MTS program, or the uh, Monitoring Trends in Burn Security Project. The project began in 2006, and uh, it processes all the Landsat imagery to make it accessible to the public and provides 
um, burns radi and geospatial information on fires greater than 1,000 acres in the west and 500 acres in the east. And so far, they've completed over 19,000 fires, which is a pretty awesome feat. Um, but the two products that I mostly used in my analysis were the RT and VR image that I mentioned previously, and then the fire perimeter information. Okay, so we can't just pull this uh, data and then take it for truth, so we have to calibrate it and validate it in the field. And uh, one way we do this is using the CBI protocol, the Composite Burn Index Protocol, developed by Key and Benson in 2006. Uh, and here is, on the right hand of the screen, is what the protocol, uh, the field sheet, looks like. And it's a lot to look at right now, but all you really, uh, well, all I really want you to know from this is that it, uh, averages burn condition in a 30 meter plot through these five strata where these arrows, these red arrows are. Um, <clears throat> and it'll rate each strata uh, on a scale of zero to three with higher numbers indicating uh, higher severity or de greater degree of change. So here's what a CBI plot looks like in the Southwest and these photos are uh, photos of the bright fire in the Grand Canyon. Um, and these photos are taken a year after the fire date. So for our study, we're only interested in the high severity category. So anything rated 2.25 to 3 yeah, for the CBI. With that, um, I'm going to get to part one. Uh, again, part one is I'm going to be talking about applying calibration to the MTBS initial assessment that eventually got me a larger data set in which to analyze the trend. Um, but this whole part came about unexpectedly um, in that I set out to analyze trends in burn severity and I was pulling all my data from MTBS. And the more that I worked with MTBS products, I noticed more limitations with them. So I'll begin by discussing what those limitations were and how I addressed them and then what the resulting data set looks like. Uh, and this part will be relevant to all those using MTBS data for any reason. Okay, so in order to understand the limitations of MTBS, I'll provide you with some background information on the product. So MTBS performs either an initial assessment or an extended assessment on each fire, never both, either one or the other. And the difference between the two assessments is uh, the dates in which the images were acquired and what they represent. So for initial assessments, um, uh, a post-fire image will be taken nearly right after the fire, which is this uh, green triangle right here. And uh, now we'll reflect recent change of that fire. And extended assessments, a post-fire image will be acquired uh, about a year after the fire. Sorry, I'm going to use this blue triangle over here. Uh, and then I'll provide information on delayed mortality and regeneration, so longer term effects. Okay. So that's one difference between the initial assessments and the extended assessments. So here is an example of the difference between initial assessment and an extended assessment uh, when looking at high severity fire. So this is the poplar fire, and uh, the red represents high severity, and the black is not high severity. So as you can see, the initial assessments will overestimate uh, severity by showing immediate fire effects since that image is taken right after the fire, whereas the extended assessment shows longer term effects since that image, post-fire image is acquired uh, about a year after that fire date. Um, so, you know, I, I use extended assessment uh, for my burn spray analysis because we wanted to represent that longer term uh, fire effect. Okay, so another difference between the initial assessment and the extended assessment uh, is not only time dependent, but also vegetation dependent. Uh, generally, MDVS performs initial assessments uh, in fires that have occurred in grasslands, or uh, shrublands, desert, or scrub. Um, because if you waited longer than six months, then that burn signal can no longer be isolated because that vegetation would have already grown back. So, MTBS performs extended assessments uh, on fires that occur mostly in forest and woodlands as well. And this is an example of just that. Uh, this is the loop fire perimeter uh, initial assessment. 
as you can see, most of it is in grasslands or shrublands. Okay, which brings us to limitation number one. Um, and this limitation has to do with the image timing, which I just talked about, and excluding a large amount of burned area. So because of the image timing of the initial segments and that they don't reflect long-term severity, we couldn't use them in our analysis. But because we had to exclude them, we would also have to exclude all the forest singleton area that they burned and also all the high severity area burned as well. So this is an example of the Forestry 2 fire, and it's an initial assessment. As you can see, if we leave this fire out of our analysis, we have to exclude all of this uh, forested area and all of the high severity area as well, which I think this shows all of the high severity area in the Horseshoe 2 fire, all the red. So we could not include any of this into our analysis by excluding the initial assessment. Okay, so this is what's going on at a larger scale in our study area. So if we excluded all the initial assessments, we also exclude about 830,000 hectares. Um, so all of the fires in black are the initial assessments that we have to exclude, and then all of the uh, fires in the blue are the ones, uh, the extended assessments that we're including in our analysis. So it adds up to a fair amount of uh, area excluded in the analysis just by the assessment type. Okay, another limitation is specific to the southwest. So MTBS uses the next peak of green as a guide to when uh, to acquire the post-fire image. So the southwest experiences a dual green up, one in the late summer and early spring, and another after a month in the rain. So this means that a post-fire image could be acquired within the same season as that fire. So that wouldn't really capture long-term effects, okay? And this is just an example of a fire, um, a silver fire, uh, that is classified as an extended assessment, but its post-fire image is less than six months from the fire date. So it's not really showing long-term effects. Okay, and this is the last limitation um, I'll discuss, which is the failure of the scan line corrector of Landsat 7 in 2003. So this failure caused striping of the images, which are essentially gaps in the data. As you can see in uh, the lost conscious fire, the left-hand picture, the first left-hand picture, shows the SLC fail with the black striping, and the right-hand picture is uh, what it's supposed to look like. So when this failed in 2003, MTBS was using Landsat 5 imagery as a backup but they decommissioned Landsat 5 in November 2011. So essentially any image acquired after 2011, of November, um, had a striking problem. And as we know in the Southwest, 2011 was one of the biggest fire years, fire years. so we could not properly extract uh, the high severity area within these striped images um, in 2011. So it was a pretty big problem for us. So here is just a summary of what we just talked about as far as the limitations. Um, again, by excluding initial assessments, we would exclude a large amount of area burned uh, within the forest and woodlands, and thus exclude a lot of uh, large amount of area burned severely. Uh, limitation number two, um, specific to the southwest, uh, where post-fire images are less than six months. Um, some extended assessment post-fire images are taking less than six months from the fire date, and they're for uh, overestimate long-term severity. Uh, and then lastly, the data gaps in the images. So the scan line corrector fail leaves these striping images and they're not effective for our trend analysis. So, so the objectives um, of my analysis of this part one were as follows. So to address the limitations, I had to apply a calibration to the initial assessment. And I needed to determine if that calibration was going to represent long-term severity, like the extended assessments were. Essentially, the first objective, I wanted to see if I could get, uh, apply a calibration to initial assessments and see if the calibrated initial assessments would represent severity like the extended assessments, if that makes sense. Uh, 
And then secondly, I wanted to see how that calibration would make the MTBS data set for the Southwest uh, better or how it would change it. Okay. So before we go too much further, um, for these analyses, we define severity as the degree of change of one-year post-fire relative to pre-fire conditions as measured by the RDNDR. Okay, so to reiterate, we're only examining high severity fire, not low or moderate. We're only examining high severity fire because while it has profound long-term ecological impacts and the spectral indices correlate best with high severity signals comparatively to moderate or low. And we're only examining high severity in forested woodlands uh, because spectral indices do not correlate well in grasslands. Okay. Um, Okay, so to address the limitations I discussed previously, we used an equation published by Miller and Quayle in 2015 in which they modified a regression equation, uh, which you'll see over to the right-hand uh, side. They modified this regression equation with an adjustment factor, which essentially accounts for the difference in ash cover between initial assessments and extended assessments. And that's the adjustment factor right there. Uh, so the idea was to plug our RDNDR images into this equation to get the initial assessments to be more like an extended assessment. So here's an example of what this looks like. Um, this is the dragon fire. Well, the left-hand picture shows an extended assessment of the dragon fire and an initial assessment on the right. So the red, again, represents high severity and the black is not high severity. Um, so as you can see, there's more red uh, in the initial assessment as expected. Um, and now once we apply that calibration to it, it tends to be pretty similar to the extended assessment as far as high severity goes. Okay. So in order to test the calibration for accuracy uh, when examining high severity fire, we needed to define what high severity uh, was in these RD and VR images, right? Essentially, we needed one pixel value that would be the threshold value for high severity. So to do this, we needed to ground truth uh, by using CBI plots. So I used about 1,000 plots from 39 fires from the Grand Canyon National Park, as well as 88 CBI plots from five fires in the Tocmino, Kaibab, and Gila. Basically, all of the CB I used all the CBI data that was available for the Southwest. And again, anything that was 2.25 uh, or higher was used. It was considered high severity. So, uh, so we created a regression model of the CBI field measurements to the RD and DR raster values. And I used the equation to predict the raster value at 2.25, again, which is high severity for CBI. And I got a value of 643. So essentially, basically, any pixel value at 643 and higher was considered high severity in the RDVR images. Uh, and then I compared my value to uh, similar studies that had done the same thing. And Dylan and others, uh, they got a value of 695 um, for the Southwest. And then Miller and Soad got a value of 643 in their study of the Sierra Nevada in California. So pretty similar to others as far as the high severity threshold. Okay, and this is an example of what this looks like in GIS. Um, again, this is the radio test by our DNVR image we saw earlier. And when we apply that 643 uh, high severity threshold value, uh, this is what we get. So everything in red is high severity for the radio test by our. Okay, so after I got the high severity threshold, um, and then the calibration I was going to use, I needed to test that application of that calibration in the Southwest. So in order to do this, I had to compare what the extended assessments were saying as high severity to what the calibrated initial assessments were saying as high severity. And uh, I used four fires in the Grand Canyon National Park uh, that were chosen at random to test this calibration. And these four fires listed below were the fires I used.
So here's an example of basically what I'm trying to do here. So the extended assessment, uh, I'm asking if the extended assessment matches what's going on the ground and how well does the calibrated initial assessment match what's going on the ground. And how does the extended assessment differ from the calibrated initial assessment? Okay. So how do we measure that agreement between CBI, uh, composite burn index, and the satellite imagery? Um, well, there are four different ways. And we use user's accuracy, producer's accuracy, overall accuracy, and KHAB values. So essentially, in, in quickly, user's accuracy um, will measure how accurate is the map to the user. Uh, it corresponds with errors of commission. And the producer's accuracy will tell us uh, how well can the landscape be mapped, um, which it corresponds with errors of omission. And the overall accuracy is essentially the total correct um, by the total sample unit. And then the K-hat value uh, measures actual agreement and agreement due to chance on a scale of 0 to 1. So essentially, the higher these, all of these values, the better. Uh, okay, and here's the results of the accuracy assessment we did, and it's summarized in this error matrix. And we did three things here. So we compared the extended assessment to the CBI values, and compared the calibrated initial assessment to the CBI values, and then compared extended assessment to the calibrated initial assessment to see if they were different. And here's the result. So in the green boxes here, um, the, it shows the users, producers, and overall accuracy of the two assessments. Uh, okay, and basically we're asking what's on the ground matches the map ball, and these we have high percentages here. So 92, um, I think our lowest one is 86 uh, percent. And then we have uh, a moderate to strong agreement, so agreement is stronger than chance with the K-hat values here in the blue. And then over here, we're comparing the extended assessment versus the calibrated initial assessment, and these do not significantly differ, um, which is good. And here is a summarized um, in this graph, so which didn't come out too well. Uh, but essentially, it has high overall accuracy for the extended assessment as well as the calibrated initial assessment, given by these percent values over here. And as well as the um, type of values over here, which are, and they, again, they did not significantly differ. So what this meant was essentially we could apply the calibration to the initial test inspires. Okay, so objective number two, um, we're gonna assess the difference between MCDS initial assessments and extended assessments. Uh, in order to determine if calibrating the initial, initial assessments would create a more robust data set from the southwest. So essentially, again, after we apply this calibration, how does this change our data set? So once this calibration was applied, we could add 860 more fires to the MTDS data set in the southwest. Okay? So initially, we only had 430 in the extended, 860 with a total of 1290. Okay, um, so kind of got cut off here, but uh, by calibrating the initial assessments, we added nearly 830,000 uh, burned hectares to our data set, and we also added uh, 230,000 uh, hectares of high severity to our data set by using the calibration. And here is what the, the two data sets look like. Um, so our original data set was just using only the extended assessment, looking at long-term severity, okay? And as you can see in 2011, um, pretty low, and which was unexpected, uh, first because we know that 2011 was a big fire year. Once we applied that calibration to the initial assessment, and we got the uh, this green line here, uh, we see 2011 jumped significantly and uh, drastically. So uh, this is what we expected. Okay, so 
we may be asking, well, how does this calibration address the MTBS limitations we discussed earlier? Well, we can now include all of the woodland and forested areas from the initial assessment um, by applying this calibration. And number two, we can apply this calibration to all of the extended assessments with that post fire image of less than six months, which was that limitation specific to the Southwest. Okay. And then in number three, um, as far as the scan line corrector fail, we can acquire an initial assessment of that fire and then use that calibration and then use that fire within our analysis. We no longer have to worry about that scan line corrector fail as long as uh, an initial assessment is obtained of that fire. But everyone should know um, this method should uh, be tested for all regions. It's not appropriate for every region. It's only been tested for the Southwest. Okay. Um, and basically what we learned from this whole process was uh, <laughs> basically free data from MTBS was like getting free cash. So there's always a cash. So in that sense, pulling data from MTBS came at a price, which is basically understanding what you're getting. So users must be cautious in just pulling MTBS data straight from the website. Um, folks need to know uh, what they're doing. But essentially what this whole thing did for us was it gave us a more robust data set from which to analyze trends and burn severity. So I spent a lot of time talking about all the limitations, but it was a big problem in getting an accurate um, atlas for the Southwest. Okay, which brings us to part two. Uh, I'm hearing a beep. I think people can still hear me. Yeah, you're still you're still okay. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure what that beep is. Okay, I think that was someone off the line. So, um, anyway, which, this brings us to part two of analyzing trends in high severity fire, uh, where I use again MCS's full data set um, in this in this analysis. So my objectives were from 1984 to 2013 in Arizona and New Mexico. I was going to assess trends in frequency and total area burned in all vegetation types, area burned, area of high severity, uh, and percent of high severity in forested and woodland areas. And then number three, area burned, area of high severity, and percent high severity in seven forest and woodland area fire regime types, which I will explain a little bit later. Okay, so this is our study area. Um, we analyzed a total of uh, 1,601 fires, and we analyzed all the fires, whether they were on state, federal, or private land, uh, from 1984 to 2013. Uh, and it, we're starting from 1984 because that's when NTBS um, told the Landsat uh, that we had specific Landsat imagery to analyze land security. So. Uh, to determine trends in specific vegetation types, I use the most up-to-date vegetation layer for the Southwest, which is called ecological response units, um, which are basically map unit constructs that incorporate site potential as well as historic disturbance regimes. And there are 12 forest and woodland ERUs, uh, but to broaden the scale of the study, we grouped them that share similar fire regimes into seven groups that we're calling ERU fire regime types. And here is just a list of the seven ERU fire regime types we use in the analysis. So uh, number one, which was the Madrean and Cineo woodlands and Madrean and Pinion oak woodland. Number two, juniper grass and PJ grass. Three, PJ evergreen shrub. Four, PJ woodland and PJ sagebrush. Ponderosa pine and ponderosa pine evergreen oak. Uh, number six is mixed conifer frequent fire, and seven mixed conifer with aspen and spruce for uh, forest. So this is how we lump them together based on similar fire regimes. And here is the distribution of the ERU fire regime type uh, and what they look like across Arizona and New Mexico with uh, PJ grass and timber grass. And Connors of Pine and 
TJ with sage breast, would you want, excuse me, sage breast, TJ would want having the largest area. So, okay. Let's see here. Okay, so on to our processing methods. Um, we did have to ex exclude some fires from our analysis, and here's why. We excluded um, fires with a post fire image of greater than 18 months because anything greater than 18 months would underestimate burn severity, uh, more vegetation growing back, et cetera. And we excluded uh, any fires um, with the pre-fire image of greater than two years because anything greater than two years might show other disturbance events, maybe logging, so it kind of tamper with that burn, burn signal. And then we also excluded uh, fires with an offset value of greater than 100. Um, essentially, we did this because we need to match phenology in pre and post fire images. And the offset value tells us the difference uh, in seasonal change in vegetation from pre to post fire images. So the smaller that value is, the better they match. So ultimately, we wanted uh, changes in the satellite images due to the fire and not due to the phenology. So that offset value was. Okay, so again, in this analysis, we used the RDMVR images that calibrated initial assessments, the extended assessments, and we applied a three by three focal mean to minimize the explosion in images. And as far as the analysis goes, it was a pixel level analysis. Um, some of the studies have done a fire, uh, fire level analysis. But uh, for fire frequency, we just summed the number of fires per year for area burns. We summed all the burn pixels per year. And for the area of high severity, just summed all the high severity pixels per year and the percent divided the sum high pixels by the burned pixels. Again, it's just in forested and woodland areas. Uh, for our statistical analysis, we wanted to determine if there was a relationship between our independent variable, which was time, and our dependent variable, which was area burned, area burned severely, and percent. Um, so in order to test that relationship, we would normally use ordinarily square regression, uh, but our data are time series data. And observations both in time can be serially dependent. Um, so if values showed dependency, we used another method, which was ARMA, or autoregressive moving average technique to account for this. So essentially, if values didn't show dependency, we used uh, OLS regression. Okay, so again, we're going back to objective number one. Um, I'm asking, are fires becoming more frequent, and are they becoming larger? And the answer to that is yes. Um, uh, this graph did not come out very well, but basically, they both came out significant. So uh, frequency of fires is increasing as well as area burned. And I'm sorry about this graph. I see the years at the bottom. Take number two, um, asking are fires getting larger, are fires getting more severe as far as increasing area and increasing percent in forest and woodland areas across the whole study region. And wow. And that's not lucky either. I wonder, Xander, I think I'm going to go back to um, this original one. Sure, yeah, and you can just jump to that slide. Okay. Sorry about that, I didn't see you. So this is a scrunched version of. Okay. Oh, the graph better. is better. Okay. Okay, so we, number two, again, our fire is getting larger and more severe, and increasing area and percent across the whole study region. And that answer is yes, they are all significant in area burned, area of high severity, and percent high severity. And um, so in these graphs, the, the red line indicates the slope, and uh, if there's that blue line in the graph, we use an uh, armor regression technique. And if the blue line is absent, such as in area burns, we did not use uh, the ARMA regression technique, just the OLS. 
Uh, okay, and here's what this looks like. Basically, um, I'm just using Jin, using JS, just a time lapse that I created for you. And I think, I think the other one might be a little bit better. I'm sorry for jumping. Okay. So this is just, the red indicates again high severity, and this is from 1984 to 1990, and uh, 1984 to 1995, um, 1984 to 2005, and then from 2010, and then to 2013. Okay, and finally, subjective number three, are fires getting larger and more severe and certain vegetation types? So area burned, all significantly increasing in all vegetation types. Area of high severity is significantly increasing in all vegetation types. But percent high severity only increasing in Madrian, TJ grass, juniper grass, mixed conifer free ground fire, mixed conifer with aspen and spruce fir. Uh, and not increasing in PJ, evergreen shrub, PJ, sagebrush woodland, and ponderosa pine. So pretty much across the board, it's uh, very increasing. Okay, so we're seeing increasing trends, but how much of that landscape is burned and then burned severely? So what this table shows is that the total area burned uh, for each vegetation type throughout the full time frame of study, and total area burned severely for each vegetation type um, throughout the whole time frame of study as well. So we're seeing large areas burned over 120,000 hectares burned for each ERU fire regime type. Um, and these red asterisks uh, just mean that there's significant increasing trends. So. Okay, so what I want you all to know is that we did include um, prescribed fire in, and wildfire use burns in our analysis. And uh, you know, MTBS labels these fires as RX or WFU burns. So, um, and that only occurs from 1996 to 2013. Um, but typically these fires burn at low intensity. And we also included fires um, on National Park Service land, uh, where decades of managed fires have reduced fuels. And, uh, you know, we're seeing increasing trends despite using these fires that burned at low intensity intensity. Uh, where other similar analyses didn't include these types of fires for uh, for these reasons, uh, which is really important um, in a lot of ways, you know, still seeing that dramatic increase despite using a lot of these fires. Okay, so quickly, I know that I'm kind of running out of time here, but um, how did our study compare to, compare to other studies that were similar done previously? Uh, Miller and Thoe did a study in the Sierra Nevadas in the Southern Cascades Mountains, and they analyzed trends from 1984 to 2006, and they saw an increase in percent of high severity fire across their region, and uh, as well as an increase in percent within mixed conifer, white fir, blue oak, and black oak. And they did see um, the number and area of burn increase uh, since the 1980s. So pretty similar to us as well, as far as uh, in uh, increase across percent. So um, in 2012, Miller and Safford updated their study in 2009 using the same study area. Uh, they included um, four additional years as well as 84 more fires in this new study, and they found an increase in percent of hydrogen fire in yellow pine mixed conifer grouping. And uh, again, number of large fires was increasing over time. But they didn't see an increase in upper elevation red fur as far as high severity goes, uh, percent high severity within red fur. So it's pretty similar to our study. Again, um, we're seeing a percent increase in mixed for spruce fur upper elevation forest, um, number of large fires. But you know it differs because they didn't see that increase in their higher elevation forest. But we are in Southwest. Um, lastly, I'm going to talk about Dillon, uh, their study in 2011, um, and they analyzed trends from 1984 to 2006. And uh, they looked at trends in the Northwest as well as the Southwest, but in uh, 
six different ecoregions within uh, the Northwest and Southwest. Um, so they found uh, increase in area burn and area burn severely in all three of the ecoregions in the Southwest, but only observed an increase in percent uh, burn severely in the Southern Rockies. Um, ecoregion, which is pink, so it only overlaps our study area over here. So, you know, why didn't they find an increase in percent? Um, well, we think that uh, there's several reasons. In our analysis, we included seven additional years, um, as well as many more fires by including those initial assessments. And uh, we assessed um, all of Arizona and New Mexico um, in, you know, not Colorado and Utah. Okay, so we just included more burned area in our analysis, which is probably the main reason we're seeing the difference. So like Dylan and others, um, I think I'm going to go back to this one. Oh, it's like the graphs are messed up on both of these. Okay, so essentially, you know, we, we noticed a distinct shift um, as far as trends increasing uh, after 1999. So from 2000 onwards, um, just a dramatic increase in every ERU fire regime type. Um, it was, uh, you know, if we look more closely at this area burn severely from 2000 to 2013, it's nearly seven times that of 1984 to 1990. Well, why is this so? We think climate mostly is a key player here. When we, look, when we look at the records from 2000 to 2010, uh, we see that uh, it was the warmest and fourth driest decade since 1901, and we know that 2002 and 2011 had the largest fire years in recorded history. So maybe climate, but for the research, we'll have to determine that. Um, quickly here, uh, so we know fires are getting larger, more frequent, and more severe. But what does this mean for each vegetation type? Um, so it's important to note that this is, these trends are like neither good nor bad. Uh, since different ecosystems are characterized by different fire regimes, current fire activity may or may not uh, be abnormal in some ecosystems. So for frequent fire systems like ponderosa pine, um, Zerichmix conifer, where it's well known that these fire types have been affected by fire exclusion and have departed from fire regimes, increasing trends may be uncharacteristic here, but in infrequent fire systems, such as uh, music mix conifers, we sure these systems may have not departed from historical fire regimes, and thus these terms may not be uncharacteristic. So ultimately, we just need longer term studies to understand the implications within each ERU uh, fire regime type here. Okay, so what does this mean for management? Um, well, I'm not a manager yet, so I asked one. Uh, I asked Tessa and Nicolay, Regional Fire College for Region 3, and she was kind enough to give me uh, some data regarding treated land over the past 15 years in the Southwest. So we've treated an average of uh, about 46,000 hectares a year, and uh, with, with prescribed fires specifically, and uh, another 24,000 hectares treated with managed fire, totaling about uh, 57,500 uh, hectares treated a year. So according to Tessa, we should be treating nearly 300,000 hectares a year, and uh, we're only treating a quarter of that. So it seems we need to keep up with treatment in order to kind of halt these increasing trends, at least in uh, these frequent fire um, regimes. So just as Tessa says, you know, burn, burn more. <laughs> Easier said than done, but we need to get creative and start making sure that public is supportive of natural ecosystem function. So again, um, with the management implications here, um, reintroduction of prescribed fire and managed fire can benefit um, these more frequent fire systems. Um, but if this trend continues in higher elevation in frequent fire regimes, um, it could pose serious implications for management in what's concerned in the past. So uh, essentially, if you know if the trend continues, we could see increases in high severity patch sizes, type conversions, extinction of habitat, altered water watersheds. Essentially, large scale changes to landscape could be possible. Uh, with that, are fires getting larger, more severe? Yes, uh, they are. So, what's next for the Southwest? Uh, 
you know, this whole analysis brought up uh, questions, uh, you know, why, why are we seeing these trends? So we want to look at how climate and weather has affected trends in burden severity. Um, the current analysis I'm working on right now is looking at spatial complexity of high severity fire. Um, our patch has been increasing, um, but becoming more homogenous over time as well. Um, you know, how does topography affect burn severity? And some, some folks have already looked at that. And how do federal land management agencies influence trends in burn severity? And the folks have looked at that in Sierra Nevada, but not quite in the Southwest yet. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank some folks. Uh, uh, you know, this project was funded by the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, you know, my advisor, Nito, not here, uh, and Pepe, and Pete Blay. And with that, I'll take some questions. But I do want you to know we are submitting uh, two manuscripts from this work that you should see within the next uh, couple months, hopefully. Um, so the first one was about calibrating those initial assessments, and then the second manuscript will be about increasing trends in high severity fire in Southwest. So with that, I will take any questions. I know we only have about five minutes or so. Great. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for a great presentation. It's nice to get all the, the background details and the, the calibration and some of the limitations at MTBS. Um, let's see. We don't have any questions in the chat window yet, but we only have about 16 people on. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute the phone line, and then that way if you want to just uh, give your questions verbally. Oh, and, and Mary Stuber typed one in. So we'll start with that, and then people can chime in on the phone. So she talks about the Rodeo Chetasky fire, and um, she's saying that their moderate burn severity had almost 100% tree mortality, so they, mo they lumped both moderate and high severity together. And um, she's wondering about the uh, methods of noting severity. And, and Mary, it may make sense for you to chime in on the phone to clarify a little bit. Were you, was that um, based on uh, BARC maps, initial BARC maps that you were working on, or was it MTBS maps? I think they were BARC maps. Again, this was back before, you know, we were using the maps from 2003, 2004 on a 2002 fire. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Bark maps are um, pretty different than, than MTBS data. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with, but yeah, the bark maps, they'll, um, they'll be generated like seven days within, um, after the fire occurred. So, and they do, I mean, I've never done a bark map, but, um, Maybe you can tell me more about it, but um, they, it's more like a soil burn severity than it is. Um, so analysts will use kind of a threshold, uh, kind of like an arbitrary threshold that they use, and then people will ground truth that. And, uh, and it depends, yeah, so each threshold for high severity is different. It depends kind of on that analyst, if that makes any sense. Right. I guess my question then is, how? What would you estimate? You know, tree mortality is in your high severity areas versus your moderate. Oh, um, that's a good question. You know, I'm not entirely sure since you know the CBI is not necessarily. I mean, so the satellite, you know, infers change based on vegetation uh, consumption. You know, uh, so. You know, I'd have to assume that the high severity is more tree mortality just based on the vegetation consumption of that tree. So I'm not quite sure. I don't have a specific answer for that because we didn't directly look at tree mortality. Okay, thanks. And uh, Dick Cook has added in a question that, that's maybe a little bit tangential to your specific research, but maybe um, given that uh, you've reviewed a lot of the literature recently, you can comment on, and he's asking about studies of fuel volume increases due to fire suppression efforts. Um, and so I guess um, maybe, Dick, if you, if you want to chime in on the phone, are you talking about uh, fire suppression e efforts and 
within the boundary of a, of a wildfire seeing fuels increase post wildfire or are you talking about the overall increase of fuels because we've been suppressing fires? Uh, the overall increase due to lack of activity in the, the forested areas particularly in the reproduction that's not being burned by uh, natural fires and those kind of things seems to be in at least in this area in southern New Mexico a big causative factor of the severity. Yeah, yeah and I think um, uh, there, there are a number of good studies uh, sort of documenting that, that increase um, and maybe um, offline we can, uh, I can I can send you a few of those but I, I think that's a, that's a great point. I don't know, Megan, if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't, I didn't look at any study specifically about um, what the numbers were for increasing uh, fuel loading is for the Southwest, but I'm sure, Xander, you have a better idea of that. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll send you a couple references, Dick, and we, maybe we can get a little dialogue on that going. Okay. Are there other questions that people want to kind of slip in here before we close down the webinar? Uh, questions for Megan? This is Mary. If I can ask a second question, Megan. Um, sure. Yeah. I'm curious if you had an opportunity to look at any of the um, pre-fire fuel treatments and and the impact of fire severity on that. And you know, there's some pretty obvious things with the Rodeo Chattisky fire, but I wondered about some of the other fires across the Southwest. Oh, okay. So you're just you're asking if I looked at uh, pre-treated area or treated areas um, post-fire. Is that pre-fire? Before the fire, the treatments that occurred before the fire, and yeah. how that influenced fire severity. No, you know I haven't I haven't received um, I haven't gotten a lot of data from that. But um, that's an interesting question that some studies have looked at at least the you know, again, the difference between Forest Service land versus, versus uh, NPS land. Um, and the, in Sierra Nevada, I think Miller did that as well. But, you know, NPS tends to implement more treated, um, more treatment than uh, the Forest Service. So we are seeing differences in different regions between the two. Um, kind of like indirect to what you're asking, but kind of related. But we haven't done that for the Southwest, and I haven't done that quite yet. But it's an interesting question. If if you have the, our emails there and you want to send me an email, I'll reply with um, some of the maps of what was mapped on Rodeo Chattisky in ter on sure. the tribal lands in terms of treatments before the fire. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, that'd be great. Good. Well, um, I want to thank Megan again, and um, we'll wrap up the webinar here, but I'll send a follow-up email to everybody, or actually I guess Barb probably will, with a uh, link to the recording in case you have a colleague who would be interested in the webinar and didn't get a chance to join, or if you want to review the information. So thanks, everybody, for joining us, and I look forward to having you on future webinars. Thank you.